Welcome, everyone, to District Divided, a D.C. sports podcast, more specifically a Washington Commanders podcast, though there may be some Wizards and Hoyas talk here today. I am Amit. That is KDOT. Uh, once again, Commanders-based podcast. So we are going to be talking about the sales update. A couple of different bids for $6 billion have been made. Adam Schefter has reported that, so you know it's legit. Um, I don't know that Gasparino, our boy, was on it immediately, but... I'm sure he got a tweet in there at some point. Oh, yeah, he um, did. <laughs> and then uh, we're going to talk about uh, our first round pick, 16 overall. What position would we like to address in the draft? And then we get into the comment mailbag, as we always do from the last episode, where we have one comment from Tony. Shout out, Tony. We'll get over there. And uh, after the pod, where we get, we're probably going to talk about the Wizards. We're going to talk about the Hoyas. We're going to talk about maybe AI. Who knows? After the pod, there are no rules. KDOT, how are you doing? Doing well. Um, did want to tell the audience. Well, it's been a couple weeks since we've seen them, right? A couple weeks, seen. yes. Yes. Uh, yeah, it's just because it's the boring period. And we don't want to bore you guys with episodes that don't mean anything, right? So we got to wait until some of the news kind of stacks, right? Yeah, you know, absolutely. And, like the sports junkies just making up shit. <laughs> yeah, and my thing is, hey, feel free to listen to them still. You know, but right. like it, we're, we're just not in that business. Right. Of If there's no content, we're not going to. Just make it for the sake of it. nonsense. To... Let's make it a little more hey. fun for you guys. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I heard but... Ronald McDonald's in the running <laughs> to, to, to buy the command. Well, okay. Why don't we go ahead? Well, Robert Griffin is. Uh, why don't we go ahead and <laughs> jump into <laughs> the commander's sales news? So there are a couple of different groups uh, that have put in $6 billion bids. And now it's up to Dan Snyder to decide if that is enough. And if it is, which group to choose from. Or maybe Bezos comes in with seven. Who knows? Uh, but what we do know is that a group led by Josh Harris, Mitchell Rails, there's Magic Johnson is on that bid. Um, they have one bid for $6 billion. And then I believe, and I'm probably going to butcher the name here, Steve Apostolopoulos, who I believe is a Canadian billionaire doing things, um, also has a $6 billion bid in. Um, so now it's heating up. The sale did not take place at the league meetings. But there is a thought that this could take place during the draft, just after the draft, around draft time. Um, and I believe Schefter actually tweeted that out, that there is a thought that it could be happening around the draft, which would be obviously very exciting. Um, Kate, uh, any, I, what do you make of the news, first off? And secondly, do you have like a preference? Do you know enough about these billionaires as to knowing which one you would like to take over this team? Um. So, I mean, as far as the news, it's always nice anytime anything comes out about this thing, because I, I think more than any of it, what it does for me is it satiates the fan base who I know. The more people you talk to, whether it be personally or see the vibes, it's like no one truly believes it's going to happen until it happens. And as someone who has never, never relented on this is still happening. This is true. I'm, I'm very, very excited to see that when you see new stories come out, at least I think it starts pushing those dominoes in the direction everybody kind of realizes, oh, oh, I guess it is real. And it, it calms everybody down. And I look for Commanders fans and every opportunity to be more calm and take advantage just because we, we we are a crazy fucking bunch of, bunch of people. I embrace who we are. Please continue. Uh, eh. <laughs> so... <laughs> Always looking to improve, you know. Mm -hmm. Oh, you could do that all the while, of course. Um, yeah. So the further, the sooner we get rid of this, uh, we get rid of yacht bitch, the better I think we are just overall. Absolutely. Um, now, as far as from a preferences standpoint, not necessarily, not really, but sorta, of, right? So like, it's not necessarily that I have like a a ranking list, but what I will say is that I can look at the guys that are involved or around, simmering around, and look at a lot of the positives. And maybe some negatives. There's some pros and cons of some of these guys. As far as uh, Charles Baklava, I'm sorry, whatever his name is, um, the 
<laughs> Greek Canadian guy. <laughs> oh, Steve Apostolopoulos, I believe. Right, Steve Euro. We can, um, we can is... Steve Euro. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> um, don't know a whole ton about him. Every time that I see him, it's like every time I see his name, most people that I'm seeing is like they're not necessarily taking him seriously. Is he gets sort of the same reaction, maybe a little more serious than RG three gets when he says he's part of the ownership group. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, look, I I don't want to take anything away from RG three. I remember when he was talking about it, there was this I had heard something about he had gotten enough investors where he was around like four hundred million dollars or something, which does not put you in a place to purchase a team outright, but it does put you part of the conversation as far as being a guy well liked. Um, even the story that he was telling to, what was it, Rich Eisen or whatever show he was on, um, where he was like, yeah, I'd love to come back to Washington and do this. And I'm like, I got no, I harbor no ill will to wear jersey three. And mm-hmm. anyone who's part of anything to just help us change out of the Dan Snyder era, Godspeed. But like, I look at Harris, uh, overall, Josh Harris overall, and I see that his, uh, history as far as ownership and the Philadelphia 76ers and things like that. And I, I look at that and I say, all right, look. I love the idea of having someone who has some sort of pedigree in sports franchises, mm-hmm. um, especially an organization that, look, while I don't like to root for any Philadelphia organization, the Philadelphia 76ers, at least to me, have been a fairly well-run organization, at least what what it is they're looking at as far as the product on the court. They are a team that usually has it. They are, they are mostly GM-led. They, they bring in a guy. You remember that whole Sam Hankey trust the process bit? Mm-hmm. They yep. will give guys free reign to try to put out the best product there on the court. And, I mean, if I look throughout the last few years, they're always in the conversation. They've had terrible luck with injuries, and some of the coaching decisions might not have been the best, but they've always been around in the conversation. They're not afraid to do big things, right? You look at the Ben Simmons era. You look at everything they've done. They're not afraid to take some swings here and there. I like that. I like an ownership that's, that could do that. But then I hear some other things about him, which is that if you're looking at like the game day fan day experience through teams of the owns, they're saying he he nickels and dimes just a little bit. He's a little bit of a cheapskate. Um, they're not going to get all the amenities you might get with some other places or some other teams. Um, and then that, like, I look at that and I'm like, all right, well, look, I kind of like the idea knowing that how much I hate FedEx field, how mm-hmm. much I hate the game day experience, how much I want someone to pour money back into it to make those days or those Sundays to give me a choice. Cause right now I don't think there's a choice. If I have a choice between sitting on a couch or going to FedEx field, I know what I'm picking 9.99 times out of 10, unless we're like in playoff contention, I get a good deal on tickets um, mm-hmm. beyond that. I'm not going, I'd like somebody to kind of skew that in the other direction. Right. Um, but then I also think about that and I'm like, all right, well, the best thing for any of us is just a winning product. So I look at that team and I'm like, all right, Harris, and what could have potentially happened on the field? Awesome. But then I look at the other guy who, what well, we don't know if he's made a, a, a bid itself, but we know that he signed the uh, agreements a few weeks ago. But Jeff Bezos, who could always sweep in. Bezos, to me, I have no idea what he's capable of as far as uh, as far as team or sports ownership. I don't know what that looks like at all. I don't know if he could hire the right guys. I don't know what the product on the field would be. What I do know is with a Bezos, the fan day experience will probably be second to none. This is the one guy who has enough capital himself to make sure that stadium gets built. Because I don't think anybody in the Harris group is a guarantee that RFK, the RFK site will be used or we'll see a stadium in the city at all. Um, those guys are probably still going to be looking for the way to make the most out of not spending as much on necessarily a stadium. So that's when you start looking at Northern Virginia or Maryland. So that's what I'm looking at when it comes to these groups. Do I care so much about them playing in D.C. and the fan day experience? But – there's maybe a question mark as far as what the product on the field is going to look like or how involved Bezos might be. Mm-hmm. What does this, what is this? Or do I go with the guys that have a pedigree as far as, uh, as far as sports ownership, but the fan day experience might not be that great. If I had to pick one, I'm going to pick the Harris group, but I would say that there are tons of positives, really cool positives, especially for the fan base with Bezos and we just not sure we all know this though any which one of these ways in which it goes is an upgrade over what we have now and have had the last 20 some years yeah I think uh just on the topic of Jeff Bezos real quick he would immediately become one of the largest personalities in the National Football League that's also something to consider and I wonder how other owners feel about that as well all of a sudden he is the owner if you will uh just because of who he is uh owning Amazon now I think with any owner, we don't really know, right? Because this isn't going to be like a five-year deal like it is with a pro player. 
you're thinking this person is going to own the team for 20, 30, 40, 50, who knows how long could even be passed down. So like there may be some initial excitement and initial like, Oh, Josh Harris, he's known for nickel and diving, but there's a ton of money going into it right now. And look at this splash signing. And then all of a sudden he'll get into who he is. And that's why all these different reports are very important is because it's important not to look at what happens the first two years. It's important to look at what's going to happen in the next 10 to 20 years. And the reality is to me, KDOT, I don't think we know enough about these guys, but the rule, the NFL is just a totally different sport from the NBA. I hope that we have uh, something in place. I think the names attached like a magic Johnson. I know RG three is trying to get in somehow. I like that. It's a group. I like that. There are going to be group decisions being made. So based on what I know so far, and it's very limited, I would also prefer uh, the Harris group, but I think there's still a bit of a ways to go because there was a thought that it could happen at these league meetings that just took place. It didn't. And now they're seeing the draft. Could it? Maybe. But I could also see it being pushed again. Um, And it's also maybe part of me going, I need to see it happen to truly believe it is going to happen. And I appreciate your voice in this the entire time, KDOT, for saying, hey, relax. It's going to happen. It's a done deal. It's a done deal. Uh, But... Never over till it's over, bud. <laughs> on this side, um, any other thoughts on the uh, ownership update or uh, or the sale here? Just excited, man. I am. I, I we're behind schedule where I thought we'd hear more names by now and more numbers by now, but mm-hmm. it's okay. Um, yeah. And it looks as though, even though it's been sort of a slow crawl to this point, it feels as though things are going to be speeding up. I don't know if that's actually true, but it does feel as though we're kind of nearing this finish line. And everybody had all those uh, what, uh, metaphors about being, what, fourth and goal or first and goal. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah. And it was just like, okay, all right, whatever. But it's it's happening. And it was a good we, tweet. It got a lot of interaction, It was, it was obviously. awesome. Yeah. But even Twitter seeing stuff. at the league meetings what uh, Tanya Snyder kind of in and out as quickly as possible – and then also seeing um I don't, I don't know that forgot his him. name the guy who was video recording uh Jim Mercer yeah yeah the uh Snyder's one of Snyder's minions mm-hmm. legal minion AJ Perez asks him what he's doing he just runs away just <laughs> runs away it's like yeah these guys are they're they're on their way out and it's just that feel good about that feel mm-hmm. really good about that is that we have something let's figure out where it is we're gonna throw this parade in this party man. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. And on the subject of RFK, by the way, I think the DC defenders having as much success as they have with their fan experience in DC in Audi field, when it's only half full, I think RFK is very much in play. Um, And I think that is probably if, you know, I had to guess, I think that's where the new site's going to be. They're just going to renovate that stadium and make it a thing. We'll see. We'll see. Um, Let's talk about the NFL draft, which is a month away. And the Washington Commanders have a first round pick. Once again, pick 16 overall. And uh, last year, that was Jahan Dodson, who I think we're all very happy with. This year, what do we do with the pick is the question. What position group specifically? I'm not going to, I don't think I'm going to mention any players specifically. uh, But my plan is to mention a certain specific group. Uh, KDOT, what about you? What position would you like to see addressed with the first round pick? I don't care. Okay. <laughs> so, so your I best am, player available. I am I am squarely right now for where this team is. Best player available. Okay. The only the only position in which I would say you don't the only two groups in which I say you do not do that for a defensive line and wide receiver. And that's okay. just because of the amount of money that we have tied up in it right now. I think everything else should be on the board for whoever the football guys determine is the best possible guy available. Um, I understand there. You you look at like the running back group that we have right now. And it's like, well, I mean, you, you, Brian Robinson showed flashes. Antonio Gibson has shown flashes over the course of a season and at least got the fumbling problem and it kind of, and, and, and it, it checked in. Um, you're like, Oh, why would you, why would you spend that? And it's like, I mean, if you got a guy that you consider to be, light years ahead or either one of those guys you need playmakers i mean i look across this team and i see we have some guys right we have Mm -hmm. uh guys that i'm excited about guys i'm excited to see get better um but what i'm still looking for i think our wide receiver group has a couple of those potential chase young montez sweat has shown potential jonathan allen shown potential but i need special talent i want those guys i want those game breaking guys um and I don't want us to get so locked into certain position groups in which you miss out, you miss out 
on the on, on a great thing. There was a tweet that uh, somebody uh, posted uh, a few hours ago today. Um, Alexa and Simon 85. And when mm-hmm. I read this, I was like, this is, and it was in response to Mark Tyler Hawks who runs Hawks yeah. Haven. Mm-hmm. Everybody knows he's very, very active on Twitter. I usually yeah. disagree with majority of the shit that he says, but <laughs> Same here, actually. he says, commanders fans, we do not need to spend pick number 16 on running back. Open your eyes. And he goes into what he lists as far as his position groups, but Alexa and Simon responds. Remember when Washington drafted LeBron Landry over Adrian Peterson? because we had Clinton Portis and Liddell Betts. There's never a hard and fast rule of best player available versus the need. If mm-hmm. anyone could go back in time, you keep Ryan Clark's ass here, and you would have never drafted LeRon Landry as much as how excited it was at the beginning. Yeah. So, like, I look at the – and you look at Adrian Peterson, and he is – since I've been an adult, since I was going through K-12, through um, he is either the first or second best running back I've ever seen play. Um, it, it's either him or Dalian Tomlinson. That's mm-hmm. that's my thought. It's, it's only it's a room of two. Um, as much as I love Clinton Portis, it's an upgrade. It's a huge upgrade, especially with the offenses that we used to run here. So, like, I, I look at that. I'm like, I just don't. I don't think that we're building in that way right now, in which you can say, all right, this is the next target that we have to do X on. Right? It's a mm-hmm. combination of everything, and you never really know where you're going to get the talent from. We just need guys. We need special talent players. We need guys that can game break. I don't look at the offense so far right now and say that there is one of those guys, at least in the running back room, that I can hand the ball off to and they're going to break it 80 yards. I don't feel it. I yeah. don't feel that at all. Um, maybe Eric Bianami gets to a point where he'd scheme up something that uh, that, that uh, Terry McLaurin or our boy Dotson can be that. The dude mm-hmm. that can take it on an end around and take it 80 yards, but I still haven't even seen that yet. I see John as, as a deep threat. Terry, maybe. Terry, Terry, probably closest thing we got to it. But we need playmakers. And anywhere that I can find that, whether it be a game changer on defense that could be a ball hawk that can mm-hmm. run it back to the fucking end zone, I need more of that. So that's where I'm at with best player available. Okay, no, I, I like the argument there. Uh, for me, what I'm going to say is offensive line, first and foremost. I think... Jack Del Rio has been in charge of this defense for some time. At a certain point, you have to make the assumption that he's got the scheme figured out, he's got the system figured out, and he's had enough time to get the players that he needs in order to succeed. If he goes, I need more, I mean, it's been enough time, in my opinion. Get it sorted out. We need to help this offense out. Eric Bieniemy is going to be under a microscope. We're aware of that, right? People talked about him being a head coach. It hasn't happened. Here he is trying to create his own name purely his own name away from Andy Reid. Andy Reid talked about that at the owner's meeting. Um, Then you have the idea that Lamar Jackson is available and we are choosing to go with Sam Howell. That is true. Okay. And I actually agree with the team. You know, if we, if we really do believe in the guy, fine, but you better be damn sure you give him as many chances to succeed as possible. Right. Because otherwise we are going to look back at this off season as the off season where for two first round picks, you could have made a good enough offer that you got a 26-year-old former MVP QB and instead went with Sam Howell. So you need to make sure this guy succeeds. It's very, very important you do so. To do that, it's the less sexy pick. It's the offensive lineman, but you need to. That's where I'm at. Um, And one more thing, which is maybe a bit of a take, because I know we've talked about Michael Mayer and Dalton Kincaid, I believe is how it's pronounced, but I'm not sure. Um, I would not go tight end. I would not go tight end in the first round simply because I think your return on investment in the first round, it doesn't seem to match the pick. Okay. So like as of right now, I mean, Kyle Pitts is still incredibly young, bit of a down year. You could argue what the heck was going on at Atlanta, but so far I I would say disappointing. He could still go on to be fantastic, but for the time being disappointing. But then you look at TJ Hawkinson, Noah Fant, Hayden Hurst, OJ Howard, Jermaine Gresham, like all these different guys were first round picks. Uh, And if you go back and look at all the first round tight ends, I don't think it was worth the pick. You can still get other ones. This is considered a deep tight end class in the second, in the third, and you could still get a perfectly good one. So that's what I would say to avoid with our first round pick. I would go offensive line, KDOT. What do you make of that? I don't... I don't necessarily disagree. I also know that when it comes to the tight end position, while I'm still probably pro- pretty high on at least one of those guys. Um, mayor, of course. Mayor. Uh, uh-huh. 
and the re- I'm high on Mayer because I am higher on him than I had been any other tight end prospect in a few years. So including like, Kyle I, Pitts, you were high on him. Yeah, I was for a different for a different reason. Like okay. I thought Kyle, Kyle Pitts to me was I, I didn't even look at him as a tight end. It was just like this okay. this guy, just from an athlete standpoint. Like I don't Freak give a athlete. fuck if you want to put him at running back. I don't give a shit. Like you. <laughs> This is he's just a freak. He's a freak. Yeah. I, I, like I don't I don't see that necessarily, but it, like I don't I don't have comparables to Kyle Pitts. I just don't. Mm-hmm. There's nobody that I remember coming out of college as far like like I'm going back to like as far as prospects go, like Kellen Winslow maybe. Like I'm I'm like sure. it's it's just a different thing. Um, because yeah, I don't even like like blocking wasn't even something I really gave a fuck about when it came. <laughs> like I'm not looking at him as far as like a full tight end. Mayor to me is that I when I look at what it is that I'm looking for in what I'm saying as far as like blocking mm-hmm. and catching, if I can get a little bit of both of those things, which I need both, mm-hmm. um, I just look at that position. I'm like, it, it's of great value to what it is you need in your team if you have a guy that can do both. Um, Lord knows, I don't know if he's the next George Kittle, but like I'm hoping he is because like that's the a George Kittle on your offense does a lot of stuff for you. It allows you to do so much more in your running game. It allows you to have your quarterback, whether it be a, a Mr. Irrelevant, sit back there and know that he can get the chip block going correctly before he goes out and becomes the safety valve for you. Sure. So, like, that, that's what I look at when it comes to tight end and, and mayor. Um, but, yeah, you're right. As far as, like, if there is a position group of the most need on this team, it's offensive line. Yeah. Um, clearly like it's, we talked ad nauseum throughout the season about the way that I felt about some of these guys. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I'm not, I think Ashley dude, we were just talking about from a tweet standpoint is a lot lower on the offensive line than even I am. Um, yeah, we need help there. Cause I, I was actually, there was another tweet that somebody posted out yesterday where they posted, um, what was it? Uh, Trent Williams. Did you see this? Trent Williams, uh, London Fletcher, Champ Bailey, and Jordan Reed, and they were like, if uh, if the team could add one of these guys tomorrow, who would? Oh it be? wow, that's an interesting question. Who'd you say? I uh, initially I said London. Initially I thought London Fletcher. Then I immediately recanted because I was like, even the type of linebacker that London Fletcher was, mm-hmm. I don't think we necessarily need that for this offense or for this defense right now. Okay, um, as great as he was. I'm but Champ then, or Trent. I'm one of those two. I'm just Champ, deciding which one. It's Champ or Trent is clearly yeah. the one, the the two. And I think I'm skewing more in the direction of Champ than I am to Trent. But I really don't think there's a wrong answer between the two. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, you'd love a Trent Williams on your team leading the blocks for these guys and the running backs or just knowing that you have one side of the line. He's going to go down as one of the best ever. <laughs> I mean, we know it. We He's the first the ballot Hall of yeah. Famer. And right. He probably won't go in our uniform, which is fucking nuts. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. But, um, no, I would – and for that reason, I would go offensive line again just because we talked about how talented the offense was on paper last year. Right. We had Carson Wentz coming out. We didn't necessarily agree with the trade the moment it happened. Then we warmed up to it a little bit. And you see, right, Terry McLaurin, Jahan Dotson, Curtis Samuel, Antonio Gibson. We draft Brian Robinson. We felt confident in the weapons that we had. And we just were not getting the offensive production we expected. And all of a sudden, we were relying on a defense that we didn't think outside of the defensive line had a whole lot of talent. And they actually held up pretty well. So. Now I go, okay, well, let's really make sure Sam Howell has a clean pocket. Let's really make sure he is able to succeed. And again, I do think there will be questions midseason if the offense is not producing and you go, do you regret not going after Lamar Jackson? That is very much an inbounds question at that point. If the offense is severely struggling, we're talking like 30th in points or something like that. Two things. One, sure. my best player available could be an offensive lineman. I'm just telling the I'm yeah, telling yeah. the front office, I, and I'm just going more focused yeah, yeah. on. I'm hey, t- let's really look at this right. group here. I'm telling the off- I'm telling the front office, do not hamstring yourself by saying we can't look at this particular group because of the value of this group. You need. Oh bodies. yeah, you don't say right. anything. By the way, you say I, best player available. Just to, be to clear. me, you yeah, need yeah. bodies. So the best guy <laughs> that lines up, and I look if they go through it, and Anthony Richardson is sitting there. Because of whatever, and they, and they really, really, and they think really like him. Go get the him. Next, yes, I don't give a fuck. I agree. Go get I him, and I, and I will defend it 
and I'm mm-hmm. hoping they're right. Like that's mm-hmm. that's that's what it would boil down to. He won't be sitting um, there, but but yes, yes, right. <laughs> and then uh, <laughs> number two, the Lamar. Uh, just quickly on the Lamar Jackson thing. Um, it's not about. It's no longer. It has not been about whether Lamar Jackson is the right fit for anybody. That's not. That's not the thing. Correct. There are the Kansas City Chiefs, the Buffalo mm-hmm. Bills, the Cincinnati Bengals. The Chargers. Yep, the Chargers. I think that's it. Eagles. Nope. I think that's it. Really? Okay. Those are the only four teams in the NFL that should say this guy is not somebody that we should look and see what what would happen to make it work. Every yep, other right. team in the NFL should be looking at this. The reason they're not looking at this is the same thing that I, I've joked about it time and time again on this pod and other pods. They hate Jimmy Haslam. <laughs> yes, no, they hate this guy. Cleveland Browns owner. Yes, right. just to be clear, because of the Deshaun Watson deal. For those that didn't know Jimmy Haslam's name, yeah. The argument about whether or not he overpaid for Deshaun. Look, it's I'm always on the side of the players versus the owners as far as getting their money. I'm on Lamar's side right now. This was the wrong guy to break the record for. He did overpay. It yes. fucked it up for everybody else. It did. This is what they're doing. The leak, and this is everybody talks about whether or not it's collusion or anything. Collusion does not need to exist if you have enough parties with shared interest and goals. They don't need to talk to each other to know what it is. That they're it doing. is not the definition of collusion, but everyone agrees, and they didn't even need to talk about it. Right. Deshaun Watson got overpaid a fully guaranteed deal. We're Lamar not goes, this. hey, I would like one better than him because I am better than him. I think that logically makes sense. However, because all 32 owners agree that that was a massive overpay, they are all sort of looking at each other going, there is no we're chance in hell we're this. beginning this. It's because going to be if, less than that. If Correct. Lamar gets it, then Joe Burrow has a Super Bowl appearance. What the fuck is he going to get one? Like mm-hmm. you're good. They do not want this thing. They do not want the. They don't want the genie out of the bag. That's and that I, I don't agree with them. I'm on the opposite side of them, but I understand what, what they're doing. It they finally all do- look bad because of Jimmy Haslam right now. Yes. Right. But see, just, and that was the only you know, now they're like, the oh my gosh, we're not going reason, after Lamar. Yeah. The only reason I thought there are basically two guys in the NFL right now that I think have an opportunity or a chance to get Lamar Jackson. It's us and it's Indianapolis. The only two reasons I picked those two teams is that you have two owners that don't really give a fuck about what anybody else is saying. If mm-hmm. this I kind of was rooting for this, and I don't know if this makes the team better or not. I know I'm rooting for Lamar Jackson. I don't know what you'd have to give up to do it. And I know that's a significant part of the salary. It'd be going to this one guy. But what would be a better fuck you on his way out of the door than being <laughs> a hero to the players than Dan Snyder saying, fuck it, let's just go. Dan Snyder could have two middle fingers in the air to the rest of the league. Yeah, ha, guaranteed he technically could. Bitch. Like You technically could. That, to me, screams possibilities. And, like, Dan, you could you could literally be a hero in the eyes of the players union and the players forever. You 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 broke down the barrier forever because the second contract it's over. You you this is now the market. <laughs> like and he could do that if he really he wanted to stick his finger in the fucking eye of the rest of the league. And I part of me just from a chaotic standpoint. Is highly well, but then we go back into the indemnification. Every single owner is going to be like, fuck it, we're unloading the clip on this guy. <laughs> yeah, the moment possibly. you're gone, these stories about you are going to be everywhere. And I'm not just talking the Washington Post. The Express will be back, and it will be loaded with stories about you, my friend. It, and it's free for you, everybody. I'm in, I'm in yeah. England. I don't give a shit. I'm a hero. No, can't read it. <laughs> I'm gone. <laughs> Renounce the citizenship, everything. Lamar in D.C. I mean, that would be a hell of a bang. That would be something. That's the reason I don't think it would happen. I honestly think these owners would just give everything they have to the press at that point. Be like, screw it. We're taking this dude out. <laughs> It'd be so great, though. Be so I mean, great. Oh, I mean, from a drama standpoint, we just, imagine our episode where we're like, five years, 300. <laughs> He's done it. How would you guaranteed. feel about it? Like, that's the thing. It's like, I, I know. Feel, I mean, I as a fan, from a Caps, from a Capsway standpoint, hard to feel good about it. However, like, <laughs> it would be exciting. Like they're they're obviously both things. You'd be like, oh my god, we're getting Lamar Jackson. And on the other hand, you'd be like, wow, he's going to be throwing to you and me, K Dot. There's no money for anybody. <laughs> to me, it's like it's the same fuck you, Dan Snyder energy that I have. 
Uh-huh. But it'd be like, while you've used our franchise to do all the evil in the world, you did it for right reasons, and I'm just angry. Oh, okay, so fair like, enough. You're just <laughs> frustrated. Yeah. I'm just frustrated. Like, you, you fuck, fuck you. Like, Don't really know what to feel. Yeah. <laughs> I'd love, but yeah, yeah, Lamar Jackson, the Bergen angle. I mean, hey, in the it. moment, in the moment, it would feel great. You're never going to get the idea of Lamar Jackson. You know what this is? Th- that is literally a credit card. That is literally spending on the nicest possible thing. You're capping your limit and then some on your credit card. And then once the bills do, you feel like shit. It's like having a great night out and you're drinking, you're having a lovely time. And then the next morning and the morning after and the morning after you were paying for all of it. And then some that is, that is literally what that would be. To so me. Why, well, why is Dan's like, I don't give a shit about the credit card. It doesn't exist oh, oh, yeah. No, he doesn't have to deal with the hangover. Yeah, See, that's the beautiful thing. I wonder if that. Oh, man. You know what? Maybe we talk more about the ramifications after the pod, because does anyone want to buy the team at that point? You yes. would. You would. But my God, what you'd be doing. <laughs> That'd be funny. Because that would overshadow. Here's another thing that would overshadow any signing they made. The new owners. Right. Yeah. They want to make the splash signing. Well, there's going to be no splash signing initially Late. with the, yeah, with the, work with on the, the stadium. calendar, right? Like it's not they they. Oh might... no, no, no! But I'm talking about even in their first off season. Oh no, 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 no! That'll that that'll make news. That would make news. Those would make news because the you, the the coverage the Lamar Jackson signing would get mm-hmm. over the course of the next year would be right. not so. It nobody saw about so. Russell. Nobody saw about Russell Wilson right now. It's the off season. Nobody no. saw about that. So like, you, you'd get that same vibe, and there'd yes. still be. Everyone looking and cursing Dan Snyder's name. But then next yeah. year, it'd be, what are they going to do to load up to make this Lamar Jackson thing work? Who can they afford to go get with the Lamar Jackson thing? Yeah, no, I, I mean, you would you would need your GM to just do amazing, amazing work. And you would also see some like vets be like, I believe in Lamar. I'm on his side. He 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 batted for us. I want to be there at the trail end of my career where I still feel like I can give and help out. Um, I think it would be interesting because I think we would be seen as a contender with all the QBs in the AFC and then Lamar's in the NFC, right? Like, because yeah, it I don't is... know anybody says Lamar Jackson is still a top five to me. I can make an argument for top three. Um, and everyone who's saying all this shit QB? about him, I'm yeah. Top three. Yeah. Okay. We got another after the pod topic. Uh, let's Va- jump over value to the position, value position, the the rushing yards, Matt, the rushing yards. And TDs uh, of do course, Matt. of course. We'll, we'll, we'll jump into that as well. Um, let's go over to the comment mailbag, shall we? Where we do have the one comment shout out Tony P 56, Tony. Right. Um, we were talking about AI chat GPT last episode. So that's just the context here for the comment. Tony writes, I use chat GPT to write an absence excuse letter for my two kids for the week we went to Disney World. I also used it to write Air Force award packages. There's a nugget for your military listeners. Understand it's early in its development, so it's not going to be perfect. But if you ask general questions to help, you start your thoughts for a college assignment or give it data slash info and tell it its parameters, it'll give you gold. Anyone curious about it, create an account and ask it, what is macroeconomics? Thank you for the comment there, Tony. I appreciate it. I'm starting to, I was telling Kate uh, just before we started recording here, I've started listening to a whole bunch of podcasts on ChatGPT. It is exploding right now. I mean, everyone's talking about it. Have you, KDOT, asked ChatGPT, what is macroeconomics? No. Not yet. I have not. I got to ask it right now. But uh, so... What I have done with it since we last talked about it is, uh, as Tony was saying, so the the idea for me, and I think I might have alluded to this, uh, everybody's in this, there's this weird thing, like if you listen to Joe Rogan or whatever, there's, we're hitting this territory where what you, Elon Musk and Steve Wozniak and some of the other big tech guys wrote a letter asking them to slow down. Slow down. On the AI thing. Ho, ho, ho. And yeah, yeah, Neil deGrasse Tyson has come out and say, why they, these guys need to chill out? Like, it's not like that. <laughs> um, I am from the idea if, the, if they're, I might have talked about this in the last pod, but the, I don't think AI is coming here to take everybody's jobs that are ruin everything right now. I don't I think that's, I think that's short sighted in the thought process. I think what people mm-hmm. got to understand is if there are two companies, one company could replace their human workers with AI and get the same output, maybe a little more output than when they did when they had their human workers. It's one thing, but what I think companies are going to do is have the humans utilize the AI properly. 
And if you can do that, you can get 10 to 100 times the output that you used to get using the AI properly. So this is why I'm telling everybody to kind of, you need to start learning how to get certain things out of this. Um, I won't go into specifics about exactly what it is, but uh, I was down in South Carolina a few weeks ago and I was uh, chatting with a friend. And me and her used to do, uh, me and her worked together at a particular company where we were trainers and we would help okay. people and coach and stuff. And what we've been doing is utilizing what we did best as far as uh, that coaching. And we are rolling out our own training program to then go and set up in certain small businesses that have salespeople, how to sell to certain aspects of stuff. Hmm. We've developed an entire binder with the help of the AI. The hardest part is you have all the information and collecting it and expanding on certain things, the examples and how you set, how do you do assessment tests, how do you do all this kind of stuff. If you feed it the right information that, you're, that you know, that you're knowledgeable about, it's able to give us step by step and then the best practices for teaching these things step by step. So we've already run, I've had it build the website for me. It gave me the coding as far as the website. We already have our bios, everything are up and running. I have it, the the training, all we're doing is putting it into a more finalized product look. Um, but that's something that would have taken us six months to completely get down. Yeah. Through two weeks. It's unbelievable. And so, and just a quick note on this, like Tony also said, it's not going to be perfect. So like, for example, you you still are going to have to do your own filtering too. Uh, as a human, as you read through the answers and make sure that while it's maybe 95% correct, there may be 5% that's off or 99% correct, there may be 1% off. An example I saw online was someone asked for the, for soccer fans out there, the combined starting 11 for Liverpool and Manchester United. And it was actually pretty spot on, except for one name, one name being Kevin De Bruyne. And if you know who that is, he's a superstar for Manchester City, <laughs> Manchester United's yeah. biggest rival. So there is like, you know, if I just skimmed through that, I'd be like, chat GPT nailed it. But because I read it word for word, I was like, oh, wait a minute. That is actually a huge error. So like there's still some improvements to be made. It will continue to be made, though. Rest assured, uh, chat GPT four with a much, much larger training set than just regular chat GPT. Anyway, no, I mean, we could I, go I on. I did about this type in what is macroeconomics and yeah. it does give me an I'm not going to read the whole thing because it's pretty long, but it is giving you a step by step understanding. of it. I think what, just, what people need to understand is that you can't look for chat GPT to be both your encyclopedia and the end product of whatever it is. You're well using. said you have to figure out the stuff that takes you too much time. The time sucks stuff is what you have an assistant that is not human that you don't have to worry about work hours you don't have to worry about treating them nicely you can get what it is you need to get out of them it's if you had unlimited interns that weren't well they weren't completely well versed love the way you've asked this yeah how could you utilize them this is what you have to kind of conceptualize is the the idea you should still have the knowledge and the know-how but what could you do if you had a bunch of minions that could complete task in a, in a microsecond that's that that's where it gets interesting the the boring coding that you don't want to do but you know this is here is the formulas that you need here's the data that you need i need the output here i need you to do this legwork for me to get me what it is i need here the, you start realizing that the it's just limitless possibilities and i even have a theory as far as ai and um you know, I'm not even going to go. Into it. I have this is about to change us forever. And I do think it's a truly, truly amazing and truly a good thing. So not only do we talk about sports on here, but we give out free, amazing advice. This is District Divided, a DC sports podcast, more specifically a commander's podcast. I am Amit. That is KDOT. We talk about the commanders. We now talk about AI um, and we are going to be talking about the Wizards, the Hoyas and Top three QBs in the NFL, along with any number of other topics in After the Pod that is about to begin. But first, please like the video. Please subscribe to the channel. Please comment so that we can read those out and have discussions like this and interact with you guys. Um, and yeah, we will see you in After the Pod starting prepare right. for our robot overlords. Now. Okay, so we can continue talking about it if you want to. Do I still, or... Am I getting fuzzy? 
a little, like but that's okay. A fuzzy. All right. Yeah, that's because don't worry, don't worry. AI is going to take care of you, no problem. Um, but <laughs> let's let's uh, do you want to continue talking about AI or you had one a, thing? You have had you a heard, basketball. Take. Have you yeah. have you ever heard of the movie Her? Have you watched the movie Her? I've not Phoenix. watched her. Is that Joaquin Phoenix? Yes. Okay, I've heard spectacular things. It was nominated for Oscars and stuff. It's like a that, top so. five all time movie for me. Top five. Okay. It's, Probably it's, a must watch at this point. It is an absolute must watch to me. It it is one of the greatest movies I've ever watched. It is in my top five favorite movies of all time. Okay. I had a crazy thought process, Hit me but with I it. really do think with the uh, keep things kind of somber. But I'm be, tell me if I'm crazy. Sure. I think that the most dangerous sect of the population right now are sexually frustrated American males. I think that the okay. I think guys that right now feel lonely mm-hmm. um, don't feel as though they have anybody that they could talk to, have anything that they can get any feedback from, don't feel loved, don't feel this that, and the other. They're frustrated. They don't know how to take things. They don't know how to deal with stuff, and they act out in crazy ways. You see the suicide rates increasing. Mm-hmm. You see things like the school shooting that happened the other day. You you right. see things that keep occurring in which you're just like, there's an aggressive side to the American male that's kind of existing right now that's terrifying to me. Okay. And I, I am truly thinking that there's a two-pronged approach to this. Number one, legalized sex work. And number two, more AI in the standpoint of allowing people to have a personalized field experience with something. And I think that that to me is going to be, I think that when I watch like the movie Her, Mm -hmm. I do think that there is a future for artificial intelligence dating. I do think that there's a way in which you can get or feel. It's the same way that people used to feel about online dating 20 years ago for the Mm -hmm. weirdos, right? Everybody kind of thought, eh, you're doing online dating or you, you, did you, were you? My, oh, my I, uh, okay, okay, I see what you're saying. The way it's being perceived right now. The way it's yeah, being yeah. perceived, right? I do think that the perception of that might change soon. And you start realizing if you can start teaching it more things and like chat GPT-4 where you're starting to get more personality mm-hmm. from it, I do think that there's something interesting that can happen there as far as what it is that connection will even mean going forward. Or what it feels like to have, yeah, connection. What it feels like to be connected to certain things, and what that means, or what you're allowed to be connected to socially, could yeah. change all for the better. That's interesting. Yeah, I, but you know the thing about it, K. Dot. I'm not disagreeing. Uh, in fact, I'm still uh, just sort of processing what you said. <laughs> Sound like a computer, but uh, <laughs> I, no, I appreciate you saying that because I still don't know what this can be. Right. I, I'm still learning a whole lot more about it. I'm learning a lot more about the inputs. Like primarily initially it was just a bunch of text. Uh now with uh GPT four, it can also take semi structured data, unstructured data like images, for example. And like that is crazy to me that it is also learning from images and stuff like that. So it's a really fascinating topic. I do think just even the current social structure that we have is vulnerable to change here. Right. Um, Yeah. Especially if you do get in the direction and you do entertain the idea that certain jobs can be replaced by robots in the future. If you're able to take this intelligence. Right. And I put that in quotes because uh, it's similar to writing a computer program. You think the computer is doing something amazing. It is. But it's also stupid. It's telling you it's doing exactly what you're telling it to do. I think it's that to me is where I I get the idea that. I the intern thing that I said this last up before the be, during the episode mm-hmm. I never heard before I just I came up with that and the, I'm I'm doing more thought thinking on that mm-hmm. in the sense of what it is that I think the AI is in a microcosm mm-hmm. which is that I'd almost look at this like Chat GPT is the ultimate intern when mm-hmm. intern first shows up they're dumb they're stupid. The yes. only things that they learn are what they pick up off the information of the day that you give it. Usually you you have it for menial, stupid tasks at the beginning because it's all it can be trusted for, right? Right. Go grab coffee, go make copies, go do this, go do that. Yes. And the longer you feed that intern information, the more you could trust it to do other things because it's more capable to do other things. Mm-hmm. And I think what you're seeing is that if everyone is utilizing this thing universally across the world and feeding it information, it's the ultimate intern. It's the intern that's learning how to do everything. 
just a little bit better. And you'll be able to trust it with doing more, just a little bit more, each iteration that we that we go, because it's learning, it's it's capturing more inf- information. It's just data. It's just capturing yeah. and being able to process data. And the more it gets, the more it learns, the more it feeds, is the more it'll be able to be trusted to do other things. Oh, so, absolutely. I mean, you're, and what we're looking at as far as like the menial work, it'll start turning from... I don't need to trust to just do the media work to it can handle much more complex things. That's what's going to happen. When you talk about like people that sit in front of computers controlling electrical grids or computer uh, uh, train, train schedules. If you think like the amount of effort that it probably takes Metro to plug in things in the computer programs, but still have people that exist to try to maximize the best out of a train schedule. Mm -hmm. If you could then say, Hey, the AI knows the train knows how many trains we have to run. The AI knows how many passengers we're going to have to get. Can it process what the train schedule needs to look like? Cool. All right. We've trusted it with that. Mm-hmm. Do we really need to oversee it at all? No. Looks like it's got it. You've just well you've now and, fully and so, and so that's where it gets super interesting. And I feel like um, I do want to read more about this. I do want to learn more about this. That's why I've been you know downloading the various podcasts from various people that. I'll be honest, I don't even know our experts. I think everyone's trying to figure this out right now um, and projecting what it could end up being. My thinking is as, as you go, well, yeah. And so as the tasks get more complex and stuff like that, and its ability to do the mundane, right? Because it'll do just about anything you ask it to do within certain parameters right now. Uh, but as those parameters expand, and let's say they can do, they can over time, like we're talking years, years, years down the line, um, you know, you have a robot chef, let's say you teach it how to cook and it, it can cook. Um, and then, you know, helps around the house and stuff like that. At a certain point, when is money still, you know, it, it gets very, very interesting, which is that to me is and why that's why time I, I hear pushback. Right. Go ahead. From the Elon Musk. Or from that's the exactly it. That is exactly is it. the moment that I push back against them. Yes. Because I think that what scares everybody is that there is a restructuring of what it is we value or what it is we assign value. That was the very first thought I had when I saw Elon and Steve Wozniak mm-hmm. pushing back was, hey, we don't know what this is, but also this, this changes is threatening my wealth, right? This, this changes the structure of me at the top. What, what makes someone yes. wealthy and what do we attribute success or anything there to? Right now in this society, it is tied to how much money you are creating and basically what it is you do for work. Those mm-hmm. are the things that we kind of assess as far as that goes. Yes. Um, now, people have different ways of assessing that, right? Some people might put more uh, put more stock in athletes than they do scientists in some realms. Some mm-hmm. people might put more into the arts than they do. When you then realize that anything can be created or done that we would typically do an assigned wealth to, I could get a paycheck for doing X work. Now it's no longer. What is that? What does that look like as far as a society? To me, it's unlimitless possibilities because it means that you can unlock human beings Mm -hmm. to finally be free. And I think that's the thing that people don't. It's freedom. The idea that you are no, if we can can have these things being taken care of, everything basically being taken care of. You can do what you want to do. You can do anything you want to do. And that yeah. terrifies the people that hold the power structures and have a lot of wealth or have a lot of meaning in this society. Because what does that mean? Mm-hmm. And I'm all for it. It's a revolution. Oh, it can level it can level the scale for everybody. It, it, right. It's a very but also, I mean, this could go any number of ways, right? Like that's the idealistic, like if everything goes a certain kind of no, way. It'll never always go good though. Right, right. No, but just to say that bloodshed. like I think it's well within the realm of possibility. You know, like it, it is a fascinating discussion. It's no longer a realm of possibility. It, I feel the same way about this that I do about the Washington Commanders being sold. It's happening. We're gone. It's over. We're we are going down a road. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh this. no, you can't stop AI. Just to be yeah, clear, it's over. It's anyone over. that thinks you can. <laughs> it's, it's it's over. It's too late. It's being worked Danger. on. It's being right. trained. You can't slow this thing down. They're going to scare you. Now yes. comes the time where people are so afraid of things changing, which is what we're always so afraid of is change mm-hmm. as society. The powers that be that things are going right for them right now do not want the world to shake. We, me, I don't really have that much to lose. 
<laughs> Let's Same. go. Right. And so, and that's where I also want to, for the listeners that are still here, of course, want to say that, hey, it's like if you were being strapped onto a roller coaster and let's say you're afraid of heights or something like that, or you're afraid of just going that fast. All you can change at this point, it sounds scary, is your attitude. It's happening. So do your best to embrace it and get excited for it and figure out how you can leverage it also. Right. Uh, because yes. that is what can make it more exciting for you as well. Just wanted to put that out there as well. It, because 100%. you can, it's a choice. It is a choice. And it may not feel like one at times. You may be really scared. And I can understand that. Uh, but it is also important to note that there is that option open to you to learn more about it and to see how can you use it. So just wanted to say that. Don't get left behind is yes. all I'm saying. It, right now, like I'm Want saying. Want the best the for all of you. <laughs> the people need to learn how to use it. Take advantage of learning how to use it. It's mm -hmm. the same way that I always thought about global warming. And this is just, this is just going to sound weird and we can get off the subject after this. Sure. My thought process when I was in high school, when there was the whole climate change debate, right? So this is 20 years ago. Climate change was not as universally as accepted as it was right now. Um, I was of the idea that I didn't give a fuck if it was real or not. I don't care. And all people are like, what are you talking about? I'm like, enough people believe in it that all you need to do is like i look at america and i was ashamed because you had an entire economic model in which you could be the leaders of because enough people believed in it that we could just change the way things are but everybody's so afraid <laughs> to change so it's like who gives a fuck make the solar panels i don't give a fuck if it's real or not make the fucking solar panel the only people that didn't want us to make the solar panels were the people that had the gas companies right. and the oil companies that didn't want to change the status quo my thought was open up the economy to new fucking shit sectors. And, and oftentimes when you, when you see, you know, things make logical sense, right? Like, oh, this helps the environment. Why aren't we just doing this? Notice who's against it. Honestly, notice who's against it and figure out what they have to lose. It becomes very, very clear why they're against it. Right. More often than not. Just wanted to say that. What would chat GPT say? about the Washington Wizards, because I don't even know that AI could figure out what the hell's going on with this team. Okay, they can't figure out what they want to do. Hang on. We got Tommy Shepard. Yeah, please ask it. What's we got wrong Tommy with the Shepard. Wizards? What is wrong with the Washington Wizards? Because we got Tommy Shepard saying the playoffs are the ultimate goal. Jack, please, let's get off that. You've got Spencer Dinwiddie coming out and saying, look, I'll do what you asked me to do. I just don't know what it is you want me to do. Uh, then you've got DeLon Wright and Corey Kisper being asked about tanking and DeLon correctly saying, hey, we're in it to win it, of course. Like, we're not, we're not going to intentionally lose games. And Corey Kispert also correctly saying, yeah, we also had 70 games to do that. And I understand where the fans are coming from. You know, priorities can change once you lose enough. There's all sorts of discourse around this team. We got Bill Simmons saying this may be the dumbest team ever. Like, go ahead, KDOT. What is wrong with this team? Nothing. I hate you. Go ahead. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, ask Chat GPT, and it, it's like it doesn't want to be mean. It's saying that it's giving me some non answer. So, <laughs> All right, fair enough. <sighs> it's doing what it's supposed to do. I recognize that. I just want to be clear. Listen to me. The idea. I am frustrated, as is everyone that lives in Washington, D.C., with the Wizards product, right? Um, the idea that we should be moving. There, the idea that it feels as though there is lacked a plan, a cohesive plan for quite some time on just what it is we're doing. Um, when you hear the Spencer Dinwiddie comments, the biggest thing takeaway that I had is I wanted to apologize to Spencer um, for, for the criticism <laughs> that I had for him as far as what I was hearing this happening in the locker room. Yeah. And then I second, it was like, that all sounds very, very true. That he was asking, what are we doing, guys? And no one had any answers. Everyone had their own ideals, had their own thought process behind what it is they were there. You had the Lakers guys that were over trying to prove they could do it without LeBron. You had Bradley Beal trying to prove that he could be a superstar outside of John Wall. You had all these different – you had Chris Asperzigas comes into town afterward. It's it's a mess. There's It doesn't feel as though there's any cohesive narrative as far as like what it is that we want to do. With that being said, I don't care that much – because I believe in something that basically has everyone. I want you to reject everything you think you know about basketball and expectations about basketball teams. The reason I say this, 
up until this year, I am notorious that I don't fucking watch regular season basketball until after the All-Star game. I might start getting into some stuff okay. and I watch playoff basketball. The reason being, I don't think the regular season matters. The reason the regular season to me doesn't fucking matter is that at any given point, in any fucking year, there are only truly four tops contenders for a championship. I would if agree. you're not one of the four, you don't matter. You literally don't matter. Outside of the top four, you maybe get to six to eight teams, including those four, so another four teams tops, that are waiting in the wings that are just might be okay enough or good enough that if significant injuries happen to the top four, they can they sneak, can sneak in. in. Okay. That's it. Everyone else in the league, you're useless. And the the, the, the idea to that I agree. is how do you get there? Okay, so how do you yeah. become one of those four teams? You need a generational talent. And the thing with the generational talent is that you can have a lot of bites at it in the apple when it comes to the draft. You can. You absolutely can. It's not guaranteed to get you that. And even mm -hmm. if you do, you also have to have a team that can pl put together a squad around that generational star. Look at the Dallas Mavericks with Luka Doncic. Look at a lot of these. Look at uh, Giannis for a few years before they went and they made the big trade to go get uh, to go get Drew Holiday, right? Like mm -hmm. there are a lot of times where you might even have the generational talent that you sucked for years to go get. And then there's a there's sort of a crapshoot depending on the rest of the way the league is worked, but how many superstars have teamed up in X place or this place? Like probably the best built team outside of the Golden State Warriors who are at the in the twilight of their dynasty. Correct. The Boston Celtics. And everybody's preseason favorites to do this and the other. I'm here to tell you this. The Boston Celtics don't have a snowball's fucking chance in hell at winning a championship if they have to get through a healthy Philadelphia and a healthy Milwaukee. It's going to take injuries from either both or at least one of those teams to get them a championship. Their hope was that Jason Tatum was turning into a generational talent this year. Looked early like it might have been the case, and then things have kind of not gone quite as well. Okay. That's the most you can hope for if you're Boston is that something's going to happen to one of the other two teams. So if you know this, right, if you also know that you look around the generational talents across the NBA, mm -hmm. not all of them are high draft picks. Where do Giannis get draft? Like, sometimes you just luck into the shit, right? So, you, absolutely. And actually, I am following you quite a bit here and, and entertaining the idea. So, um, so here's the grand thing when it comes bring it back to the Wizards. Mm -hmm. The team is fun to watch. Some nights. Some, Some nights, nights, they're actually fucking fun. Offensively, they're fucking fun. I like Kyle Kuzma a fuck ton. I like Chris Stapps Porzingis. Chris Stapps has been having a hell of a season. Yes. Hell of a year. Yes. Hell of a fucking year. Got a year. lot of credit for him. I actually Hunt. think that trade was good. Yeah. Where else in Washington, D.C. can you spend 15 bucks to actual, have an actual Here we go again. No, no, no. I get that. I get that. <laughs> we'll even I get this. Take advantage, that. motherfuckers. But right now, right now, and, and you should. By all means, but you're also support. Actually, that's a very loaded question and answer. Now that I think more about it, I immediately started answering. Was like, wait a minute, Th that's got some layers to it. I think that's why ChatGPT was like, hold on, I, I even I need a little more info than what you just gave me. Um, here's the deal. Right now, the way I see it is, the fans and the owner have different interests, and that's just the reality of the situation. I do not believe Ted Leonsis is really interested in winning a championship. I don't think Tommy Shepard, unfortunately, has to be interested in winning a championship just because it all comes down. This is why ownership's important. It ties in with the commanders and stuff like that. Ted's baby There's is the Washington Capitals. It's true. He That's loves the there's no road. There's no road. Right. And no, no, no. And so therefore the wizards are actually doing what they're setting out to do, which is be fun on some nights. And for 15 bucks, you can go maybe see an offensive explosion for a night and go home, relax and watch the other teams in the playoffs. How many teams are in the NBA? 30, 30, four. Or legitimate contenders. <laughs> but I want us to luck into the right strategy. Which I think I, that's where I'm at. All right. Well, here's here's another thing. that. I'll, but here's the other part about this, though. Yeah. We did have a generational talent not that long ago. His name was John Wall. We had the East Coast version. generational? 
I look at him as generational before the injuries. Absolutely. Okay, I love John. I don't view him as generational. I look at him as generational. There are tiers, right? There are godlike players, which I don't even say they're generational. Okay, I just think they're- generational is a strong term. I think that there are actually more generational players. This 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 generation of fucking players is actually fucking doper than we've seen in quite some time. But like they they there there can be quite a few generational players, I guess, to some degree. As much as there's like a once in a superstar. Years. So I, I think fine, I fine, think superstar. superstar. Let's say superstar. Yeah, because generational is like well, let's say legitimately superstar. like fine, LeBron fine, is and fine. Well, I, yeah. I don't know. Giannis. LeBron and Jordan are one two in a hundred year guys. That's it. There's nobody else that's close. Multi generational. Right? Multi generational. <laughs> um, well, I look at Washington. I say that we had the East Coast version of what they had in Portland at one point. What they had yes, as they far had as Dan Lillard and CJ McCollum, right. right? A team with two guys that could get you to the second round. Mm-hmm. And you're trying to build other guys and other pieces around that. It was great. The Wizards were, were, were in pocket trying to figure out the third piece, which is when we started talking about. Can we can we convince Kevin Durant to come here? Can we do, 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 do? Mm-hmm. That was wonderful. We were there. We were. That's that's how you get close to being a contender. Is Heck, you want Pierce almost put us over the top to get to the conference top finals. You see what I'm saying? So it's yeah. like you you had you were there. Then you got vastly unlucky. The best Wall gets hurt come against the, the Hawks. Yeah, Wall gets hurt. It all goes to shit. Then we're all right. Every everyone here wanted to see what happens to Bradley Beal's top banana. We learned very, very, very quickly he's not that. Not even is he not that. He might not even be your second banana on any other fucking team. Um, I'm at a point where I think he's much closer to Jordan Poole than he is CJ McCullum. Oh boy. Okay. okay. Um because here's the thing, here's what we're here. In the in the in the areas where John Wall was hurt and Beal had to step up, look at his efficiency. He wasn't. He just had more volume without Wall there, which is what made people think that he had the that he was like next level all star guy. He's not. He's just not. I like Beal. I like I like Bradley Beal. I like him as a dude. He is vastly overrated for what it is we think he is compared to what it is you're getting. Ret- he's not. He's making a lot more money than he should be making here for us. I feel like we're the Green Bay Packers last year when you knew you shouldn't have given Aaron Rodgers the fucking contract and you did it anyway. Yeah. You don't I, give Bill that fucking contract. Sure. I, I think it's almost what happened with Strasburg as well with the Nats. Like we win, we so, win. He gets his thank you contract almost. But in this yeah, that's, case, that's why it's different. We, yeah. And that is where it's different because over here, I think we, and we, even when we had the ref, the district guys on, it was pretty clear. Everyone was like, yeah, he's going to get the extension. I'm not sure he should. Right, he but shouldn't. he's going to get it, and it's just because that's where the priorities align. You're going to get those offensive explosions for 15 bucks a night, 20 bucks a night, and that's sort of how it is. Brad's happy, the organization overall, probably happy if I'm being honest. Kind of sad to admit, but it's true, and that's where it is. He is not a number one guy on a championship team. Do you know um, the record and... with or without Beal? No, not off the top of my head. What is yes. it? Terms of win percentage? Let's say win percentage. Do you think it's higher or lower with or without Bill? I actually think it might be higher without. It's not. But I actually I can understand the ball movement. (laughs) Yeah. Well, you know what? I was thinking about Kuzma as well. Okay, sorry, go ahead. Just saying Bill. Just saying Bill. Kuzma is a point that I'm Then I would say it's about even. I would probably say it's about even. So after the Celtics win, which is now they want to win games. Um 34 and 42. (laughs) 34 and 42. With Bradley Bill, they're 24 and 26, two games under 500. Without Bradley Bill, they're 10 and 16, six games under 500. Much more smaller sample size. So it is, I mean, yeah. So when I look at that, I say that it's clear to me Bradley Bill does not deserve the contract (laughs) because you want that to be a clear discrepancy, especially when you consider the name that you just said. I'm one to believe, I'm firmly of the belief that we actually might have something with Chris Stapps and Kuz. The only okay. reason I'm saying that is that like Chris Stapps a few years ago was looked upon as potentially like a dirt and a whiskey generational talent coming out of New York. Right. Mm-hmm. It was a matter of whether or not he could stay healthy. If you're a betting man, you shouldn't take that bet that he's going to stay healthy, but he has this season and this season he's looked goddamn good doing it. He has. I actually think yeah. he looks like in the right situation. He is your second banana. 
I do actually look at it's him and say very good player. Is very his, good. His thing was always, can he stay on the floor? Can he stay on the court, right? Right. And he has this season. I don't know if this is the trend for a few years because he's getting older, but he stayed healthy for a season. Kyle Kuzma is another one. A dude that he wanted to prove himself outside of L.A. And he I has. think when given the opportunities to be the guy, when the offense runs through him at certain times, they look fucking electrifying. Yeah, he's also very streaky. I, I get it. I get it. it but I think it, the streakiness also leads to the impact Beal has when he's on the court compared to where it is that they're running the offense and how it is they're running the offense. I don't want to run anything through Beal. I think he's a detriment oh, to the okay. team so, and so to the structure. Here, here's my question. Okay, so yeah. Okay, let's say that the contract is, you know, a lot higher than we wanted to give Beal as fans uh, because he ultimately got it. Therefore, I, I, from a player's perspective, he deserves it because someone was willing to pay it. Um, how would you rank Porzingis, Kuzma, Beal in terms of option on offense? That, that way. I don't even remember how you, I said it. Uh, Porzingis, Kuzma, Porzingis, Beal. Kuzma, Beal. So, I trade Beal in a Who's fucking heartbeat. Like, no you know, you know, so like you need I get to, it. I get it. I get it. Right. I get that. But so like, I, I, this is where we're at. It's just where we're at. Where we're at. Fair right? enough. Fair enough. So like, yeah, I'm yeah. hoping that he just accepts, Hey, here's a p- nice place you can go to. Um, I look at a dude like Phoenix. Phoenix might look very different next year, depending on how things end up this season, especially yeah. with Kevin Durant, even being there and the injuries happening immediately. If it flames out, I can see them trying to potentially shake things up. Mm-hmm. Do I take a Chris Paul? on this team without Beal and like a Seth Curry. Fuck yeah. Mm-hmm. I want to see what that looks like. Hmm. Do I take a Spencer Dinwiddie and a Seth Curry or another shooter with these dudes? Yeah, fuck yeah. I want to see what that looks like. Here's what I know. The basketball with Beal, while it is fun certain nights, it's definitely fun some nights, ain't a winning product. Just ain't. And as long as that's the case, like... I, if you want to be one of those, if you want to be in that Boston position, right? Yeah. One of the guys waiting in the wings. Or you want to be one of those guys who the team is built up just enough that we're waiting for our generational talent to get here. Mm-hmm. I think you got to get rid of Bill to find out. Okay. No, I would agree with that. I would agree with that. Um, man, hey, what a wizard's hole we got into there. I enjoyed that. Yeah, I enjoyed that. Maybe we can... But the thing is, it is... I think we just know what it is, and it's just frustrating, I think, is where we're sort of at. I'm not frustrated. You're not. At but you all. also don't care nearly as much. I don't think anyone should care nearly as much. I've been, should, I've been harping. But people do. Which is what people... You can make the same, same thing case with, with the commanders. Same thing with AI. <laughs> okay, is that we ahead. need to accept our reality. Just a bit better. Okay? All sorts of parallels on the show. Bas- yeah. You cannot compare basketball to football. I didn't say I don't care about basketball. I said that I don't care about ba- I don't usually care about basketball until after the All Star break. Fair enough. You Why? enjoy playoff basketball. There are eighty two fucking games. The players are letting you know through load management. None of this shit matters. If you yes. were one of the four teams, do you know your only goal to make sure that you have a win- to make sure you have a winning formula, and outside of making sure that we have chemistry throughout the team, and the second part, be healthy enough to compete in the fucking playoffs. That's right. it. That's all you have to be. At the beginning of every season, which is we, why Durant getting hurt in the layup line was like unbelievable. It, no, I called that a hundred times out of. Uh, I mean, we like, both uh, talked about yeah, KD talked about, being injury prone as hell. The fact that it Phoenix. happened in a layup line is, fu- is it's what it is. No He's old. Him. It wasn't He's even a line. Old. Actually, it wasn't even a line. It was just him. Like they, they're getting older. This is what it is. This is this is it. Yeah. So like, I, I, but I just look at basketball. And I'm like, dude, if you're not one of those four teams, in some years it's not four, it's two. Some years right. it's one. If, if if you're not one of those guys, nothing matters. <laughs> like it really doesn't Fair matter. Fair enough. Um, I I want to quickly switch this to college basketball because we do have a program that is relevant once again. Georgetown Hoyas men's basketball hiring Ed Cooley from Providence, which by the way. In the middle of all this March Madness, the Big East has won big in terms of the storylines. I just want to make that clear. In the Sweet 16, they had four teams in. And then in the Elite Eight, they had two. No, maybe three, uh, two. And now they got UConn, who's favored to win it all. That's the Big East. In the meanwhile, while that's been happening, Ed Cooley 
coach of Providence, Providence kid, 12 years coaching there, had talked about loyalty three months before, stuff like that. And then, of course, priorities changed. His daughter's down here, is a student at Georgetown, ends up taking the Georgetown job, and Providence fans have lost their mind. It turns into a national story, much, much bigger than I was expecting for it to become. But Ed Cooley has already recruited a couple players over here, a couple four stars. And you could see Georgetown slowly but surely coming back. I mean, Barstool has been all over this. Like Dave Portnoy has been shining a light on this a hell of a lot more than like just him speaking about it. No matter what your feelings are, people pay attention. Uh, part of my take having John Fanta, a biggest writer on when the heck does a big like, I mean, it, it is crazy what's going on around the Big East right now. It, it's been electric. And it's great to know that Georgetown basketball has a coach that knows how to win in the Big East, has Georgetown resources. And I'm very much looking forward to seeing there's a rumor today that Hunter Dickinson is a local kid played at Maryland or I'm sorry, played at um, played in Michigan. Right. He's gone on some deep runs with Michigan. He could be going to Maryland or he could be coming to Georgetown. So, like, it's very cool to see the program come back to relevance. I just wanted to shout that out as well as a huge Hoyas fan myself. I'm very excited by it. And I love this rivalry that's developing with Providence. We're going to kill him next season. I can't wait. Um, As a non-college graduate, <laughs> I can tell you I don't care that much. I will say the city's more fun when Georgetown's good. Um. I, I have personal ties, and my family has personal ties. I think I've talked about these stories. Uh, I've seen John Thompson choke my uh, grandfather up. Yes. I've, um, <laughs> I'm, 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 well, I've been to many a behind-the-scene practices at Georgetown in my childhood. Uh, yeah, it's it, the, I'm more excited about what it is you were saying as far as like even Barstool. So uh, I do run, as I've talked about previously, I do help with social media and consulting with a lot of bars in the D.C. area. Mm -hmm. And I do know that Barstool has tried very, very hard to get a higher presence in the DMV. If you look on Instagram or anything, they're Barstool. So Portnoy's comments make a lot more sense. It's a great way to at least shine a light on it. They're trying. As you can see, Barstool has a hard feel in New York. In Philly, Mm -hmm. they're big. In mm-hmm. Chicago, now the big cat and those guys are leaving to go to Chicago, big. They'd like something to be here in D.C., but what are the teams? What are the teams and where are the fan bases in which you have people that are excited enough that it could sustain a real presence by Barstool, right? Um, you look at Commanders fans. We're fucking just we're, – we're sad. We're just not, not great. We haven't been historically great. Mm-hmm. Um you look at Georgetown basketball, disappointing as all fuck. The last time you had a team that we were really excited about was what, 07? Because I remember the night that we won the Elite Eight, I got chased by a police helicopter. Another okay. story for another night. Actually happened at the RFK site. Remember to tell me that. I'll tell you guys that story. One okay, looking forward to it. Um, Fucking night. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> beyond that, baseball, XFL have shown... XFL for Cats. sure. Only Cats undefeated sure. team. Shout when out to you defenders. see that beer snake and you saw the coverage it was getting on Barstool, you can see the wheels kind of spinning in Portnoy and all those guys had that, all right, maybe we got something here. This is how we With get a it. new owner coming. I think, I think we're in a position right now where DC sports could be on the same wavelength as Philadelphia, Chicago, New York. Because if you look historically – I don't think people even realize how lucky we were as kids when you could turn on the TV on Saturday and on your local news channel, you saw George Michael, Tony Kornheiser, Michael Wilbon, and fucking um and and John Riggins just doing a throwaway Washington Redskins show. Mm-hmm. Do you know That's George true. Michael? Do you know George Michael was supposed to be the guy doing the Miracle on Ice announcement? He got sick. That's the only reason I Al did Michaels not know there. that. True story. Only reason Al Michaels was there to do to give that call when we won against the, wow. the Miracle on Ice is because George Michael was sick. Also, if you really want to look at it, George Michael kind of invented uh, Sports Center, the Sports Machine is what Sports Center became as far as highlight shows. If you look at everybody, the Michelle, all the people that have come through DC in the sports thing, and now we've just sort of been this outcast. It's not fun here. But things are simmering. And as a Washington sports fan, 
I, look, I'm angling for us to be the barstool guys. So like, we're, we're, <laughs> I could tell from your voice, uh, uh, from what you were saying, I was like, oh, interesting. Well, I'm I, absolutely angling for us to be the barstool guy. I talked to all the barstool uh, social media people in yeah. the DMV. The American University ones are just fucking weird, as are American University students. No, 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 no disrespect, but you AU kids are fucking weirdos. <laughs> um, I mean, just like you, I think you're smarter than most. I actually think I think American University probably has more smart students the georgetown or gw i just think they're socially fucking awkward and weird as shit and they don't have the connections that georgetown and george washington kids do which will Fair take enough. you further in life you start realizing in college is about the connections you fucking make i mean i i wouldn't know because i didn't go to college i went to party at colleges but it's so i understand i can see that's how kate learned, step by out. The way. you're right that was the education there yeah we got drunk on every one of those campuses <laughs> 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 i was I was a man of the people. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> that is interesting, though. I mean, you shining the light on. I didn't realize that Barstool was trying to penetrate the DMV quite like that. And now Portnoy, like, you know, because he will he'll shoot his mouth off. Right. Like, it's very quick to just be like, oh, it's just Portnoy. Be Portnoy. But it is interesting when you put it in that perspective and you go, oh, OK, no, no. He's actually generating a lot of comments, a lot of likes, retweets and shining a light on this situation specifically in D.C., getting more interest. I've noticed using the District of Iron account, I've been interacting even a little bit. Very smart. Data collection. What yeah. happens when we push the buttons in D.C.? We know what happens when we push a button in Philadelphia. We know what happens when we push a button in Chicago. What happens in D.C.? So far, it's been nothing. What an informative episode here, KDOT. Yeah. I mean, we've, we've talked about the commanders. We've talked about Lamar. We've talked about AI. We've talked about, oh, the last thing we need to talk about real quick. Um, your top three quarterbacks. You have Lamar in there. Oh. Before we sign off here. But okay. you've got Lamar in there. Yeah, I think that um number one is Patrick Mahomes. It's just not even fair. Has I don't even I don't I don't right. think it's even fair to put him in a one through three. He's just by himself. So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna do a one through three, not name Patrick Mahomes. Because he doesn't deserve okay. to be on a list. Sure. In my okay, opinion. okay. He's that fine. godly to me. Okay. Fair enough. Um, if I'm looking at guys that I draft or dudes that are most valuable to the team, and mm -hmm. it's more about what the team needs to do to build around this particular player. Oh, okay. I like the way I you framed that. There's an now argument to me yes. Lamar might be number two. And this thing, like I like here's the thing. I understand people want to put Josh Allen number two. I get one to put Josh Allen number two, or even Joe Burrow number two. Joe Burrow's wide receiving core. Make everyone that Lamar Jackson has ever played with a wide receiver look like a goddamn bum because they were pretty much right. So you're making the case that Lamar hasn't had nearly the level of talent as some of these other guys have at the receiving position. Or, you know, he's got Mark at Andrews. Anything. Right. Here's here's what I'll say, um, because I do agree with you to a large extent. I will also say that Joe Burrow, before he I believe it was a torn ACL, but it, it was something in his knee that just completely shredded. He was having it. Yeah. Oh, we did. Yeah. Um. In a phenomenal, he was having a fantastic rookie yeah. year. A oh, I love really, you. really good. No O line. No Jamar Chase yet. Right. Like so. To me, I, I think I, you have to put I, him. Above. You know, I wouldn't argue. I wouldn't even. I'm not right. going to argue with you if you did. Right. Josh Allen, you might get a little pushback from me just because I think he has too much of that Favre in him, where he makes his mm -hmm. dumbass decisions sometimes. Um. But I think. But if you put Lamar on the Chargers, like I get the if. I get the if here, right? Like if you gave him key. I don't even know if that's Mike the case. Williams, I'm not even going to say that's the case. We I'm can't not say that's no, the case. No, no, but here's I'm the thing. We can't know. We cannot know until we see something like that. There is no player more integral to the success of the team, in my opinion, at the quarterback position. Of course. Than Lamar Jackson. Because he is the offense. Like they haven't even been able to sustain a running attack for ever since the year that ever all the running backs went down. Was it two, three years ago now? Um, right. They haven't had anything oh my that they've gosh, been able to do. I forgot do. about that. And they this still like, almost made it. You see what I'm saying? It's like, yeah. if I, Josh Allen, to me, when you start looking at why he's so variable, is also because of what he does on the ground. Josh Allen's close to, from a production standpoint, close to what it is we saw Cam Newton and Pete Cam Newton. Sure. Who is still, to me, supremely underrated. Because I don't <laughs> Dude, think that we. Dude, he's Ted Ginn. Yeah, yeah, of course. I Relative to others, no respect. Yeah. What I still don't think we have been able to do in football is wrap our heads around i'm pronouncing things really strangely no it's wrap okay we're getting deep are, into this episode wrap our heads around what it means to be a runner at quarterback and the value 
that you're getting as far as offensive production from the position. We still have not figured out a way to put that in the tangible stat or to have a conversation about that to look at the value for the position at quarterback when you can do that. It's vastly important. If you look at what Philadelphia Eagles did last year with Jalen Hurts, right? The mm-hmm. the 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 play that I hoped that they would have banned the is sneak. this last league meeting. Yeah. The sneak. If you eliminate the ability of that sneak over the course of the entire Philadelphia Eagles season, that season looks very fucking different than it did. And I also think me, the I also think the game would be way more exciting without the QB sneak. Of course. Like of you course. actually have to try and do something else. But we're just looking at evaluation, right? right? If we're looking Fair at enough. the value of that play to the Philadelphia Eagles season, it was vast. What Lamar Jackson does on the ground, I don't think we have been able to wrap our heads around mm-hmm. collectively. And I also think that's that's one of the reasons I want him to have an agent and a PR group is for them to figure out a way to market it to us to 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 sell this part of it. Because it, it feels as though, you know when Le'Veon Bell held out for Pittsburgh? Yes. And he's like, hold on, fuckers. Y'all want to throw the ball to me 100 times and then have me rush 300 fucking times. Not right. only am I a top three running back, there's a case we made I'm a top 10 receiver, fuckers. Like, right. what are you doing? With Lamar Jackson, there's a case you're seeing a top five running back with a top 10 okay, quarterback. Okay, I see what you're saying. So so I think what's going to end up happening with him, and and I appreciate where you're coming from, and I think you can make the case because it's still ultimately in a hypothetical space. And like you said, we can't truly quantify his value as a rusher or as a rushing threat while playing QB, right? while playing with Mark Andrews, Rashad Bateman, who's a first-round pick, but still sort of unproven, right? And Hollywood mm-hmm. Brown gets traded away because he doesn't want to be there. And then anybody that tweets out from freaking Baltimore is saying, stop blaming Lamar and stop blaming this offense in terms of its talent. We don't like the system. Right. So like it is so in- it's going to be so <coughs> interesting to see what happens with Lamar. My thinking is. Watch what the Colts do at pick four, because if they don't take a QB the next day, they are putting in an offer that Baltimore cannot match. Because they don't want to give a pick four overall. And this franchise tag continues to extend beyond yeah, no, the draft. There's no rush. So there's no rush here. If you're looking for a Lamar update, you're not going to get one until uh-huh. after the draft. Because then more teams, after they've collected their draft players, you know, their picks and cash those in for players, then they're going to go, okay, do we have space for this? Yep. That's when Lamar becomes a very serious and probably the only topic of conversation i think rogers his stuff will probably get done before this draft because the packers want this year's picks whatever those may be um it gets very very interesting around lamar after the draft and i would expect if the colts don't take a qb a pick four overall oh i mean just watch them make an insane offer in my opinion for because you said it yourself colts commanders the two teams with owners that don't give a fuck go ahead yeah and just the Lamar Jackson overall thing. If you could conceptualize, I don't think this will happen because there's Jonathan right Taylor now. in the backfield, that offensive line that's typically good. I'm I'm going Pittman. one team. I'm going one team. I want you to think about this. I will. What does Lamar Jackson look like on that San Francisco 49ers team? Oh, I mean, it's a wrap. It it would be over. I'm, you see what I'm saying? Like if yeah. if you remember what Kyle Shanahan could do with RG3. Yeah, it, Lamar Jackson is year, it was always insane. better than RG3 was in yes. every category, okay? Yeah. With Christian McCaffrey in the backfield, with Debo Samuel to throw to, I, with George Kittle, I with Trent Williams out there on the lead if he wanted to run, you Baltimore gets away with a lot because they're Baltimore. The, the Ravens, they are the – I still give Bill Belichick a lot Dude, of credit. Dude, that would be – sorry to interrupt. I'm just yep. because I'm so excited by it. That is a strong case for you could see an undefeated team. The, that defense is unreal too. Like Jim Harbaugh, quarterback, offensive guy. John, his brother, is a defensive guy. They've had all these mediocre – so somewhat okay offense coordinators that come through there ever since he's been head coach since 08 now. And they, like, Joe Flacco went on a run. But they've never had offense that anybody gave a shit about, really. They right. had, every once in a while, they get a receiver, they get a running back, they do a really good job. But after Ray Rice did what the fuck he did, 
They were struggling to figure that fucking shit out too. So like, I just look at Lamar and I'm just saying, you're seeing a dude who's been asked to be the end all be all to everything, inc- everything on an offense with no help. I'm looking up the 49ers um, 2024 draft picks because they, they would need a first. I don't know if they have one. I just don't know if the salary cap works for them. The, they'll figure that out. Okay. <laughs> they'll backload the shit out of it. They'll win like two, three Super Bowls and then they'll be fine. Uh, let's see. Give me that like the offense that he wanted to do with Trey Lance with Lamar Jackson. I mean, no, I mean, it would be incredible. It would be absolutely incredible. I can't, I can't find it right now, but that is something to think about. I mean, that team is far and away the favorite. And imagine just like having money on that team to win. That'd be so fun. All my chips are in. Yeah, because they have an electric defense. Their offense instantly becomes the best, if not second best to only the Chiefs. Like it would be the offense insane. is better than the Chiefs. Oh, from a talent standpoint, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> absolutely. Oh my lord, it's done. Yeah. So anyway, no, that's a that's an interesting note to end this on. Uh, once again, this is District Divide DC Sports Podcast. Man, Lamar on the San Francisco 49ers would be something. We will see you guys hopefully next week with more content. Go to Wizards games; they're inexpensive and fun. There's a week left. May as well. Just go. In D.C., we're just hoping that you listen. 